Good morning. And I'm, I'm glad we have this 1121 time slot so that hopefully everyone has recovered from whatever it is that you were doing last night. And I guess slush is a little bit like Vegas. What happens here stays here. Um, but it's, uh, it, it's great to be back at slush. This is actually the 10th anniversary of my first slush. And before we get into it, I just want to make sure we recognize all the volunteers that make this happen. It's uh, my favorite conference of the year. And to think that college students are, are doing all this on their own is really something special. Um, but we are, are here today to talk, uh, and I'm pleased to introduce you to, uh, to, to, to Yark Kodilowski, the CEO of DeepL. Um, I need to uh, refer to my notes because um, he's a very accomplished person, and the company that he's built is doing some amazing things. So, as our host mentioned, uh, Yark holds a PhD in computer science, and if that wasn't difficult enough, he picked an emphasis in math to go with that. Uh, he's clearly too modest to brag, so I will do it for him. Um, and DeepL is based in Cologne, Germany. Um, under his leadership, the team at DeepL have built the world's most accurate language translation engine, and I am going to take a deep breath. Um, this is verified through third parties, but they now cover 31 languages, including Bulgarian, Czech, Danish, Dutch, English, Estonian, Finnish, which is quite popular here, of course, French, German, Greek, Hungarian, Indonesian, Italian, Japanese, Korean, Latvian, Lithuanian, Mandarin, Norwegian, Polish, Portuguese twice, both Portuguese, Portuguese, and Brazilian Portuguese, Romanian, Russian, Slovak, Slovenian, Spanish, Swedish, Turkish, and Ukrainian. You're, and you're trying to take up all my talk. I'm right? sorry about that. <laughs> um, if your language isn't offered yet, though, I'm sure it's on the way. Um, but maybe let's start with a little about you to get you know, the, sort of the backdrop. Tell us about what makes you so passionate about starting an AI company that deals specifically, specifically with language. Yeah, I think it's both. And, and by the way, it's a pleasure to be here. It's my first time at Slush, not, not my tenth time. Uh, so I'm pretty excited. Finland is great and, and I love the snow. Um, I think um, translation and machine translation is just an amazing combination nowadays of technology and languages. And um, I've been born in Poland. I've lived half of my life in Germany and obviously I had to learn some English and I have a basic commandment of pr French. Let's put it. Let's put it that way. Um, so, uh, so I've been dealing quite a lot with with languages. Actually, um, when I came to Germany at an age of 12, I think. Um, I was being thrown into the school and I didn't know a word in, 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 in German. I had to, uh, the teacher asked me to spell my name and I could not spell my, my own last name, which is not very easy, but I could not spell it in German properly. Uh, so, so that was kind of the, the, the moment when I definitely realized languages are important and, and, and are, but also really tricky. Um, so, um, so that probably has, has set me up for, um, uh, for understanding the problem itself. Um, and after that, in like the time when we've been starting working on DeepL, when we're starting with launching that, uh, that there, there, there was just those signs that there is amazing breakthroughs coming in with neural networks and how those can be applied to this problem and how we can actually, through technology, solve this huge problem that is, that is a, really a big one for humanity and that we, especially here in Europe, really uh, see uh, each and every day, even when we come to Finland. Right, right. So without getting too technical, I do think it's worth diving in because I think your background is, makes you the perfect leader for this company. Um, the, the, the computer science background, the math background, but also the very personal experience about learning a new language yeah. un under the gun, so to speak. What is the linkage what, you know, for AI to make translation more effective and more powerful? Because you know, the Rosetta Stone was doing translation you yeah. know, thousands of years ago. What's, what's evolved in AI to make this something so powerful today? Yeah, I mean, um First and foremost, I, I think neural networks and the AI as we know it right now is, is just the, an amazing and beautiful combination of math and computer science. It's just like really on the edge of, of both of those. If you um, and and I had the had the honor to, to kind of go to a university that that was really very theoretical, um, where a lot of emphasis was put on, on kind of the, the theoretical foundations of how things work and not only kind of the applied 
how to code in Java. Um, and I think that's, that's really important. I think, I think if you want to do cutting edge uh, research or cutting edge products, um, I would kind of advise it to everybody in the room here to, to go for that. Uh, you won't learn how to code in Java and therefore you might need like two years more to get into your job. Um, but at the end you're going to understand how, how these things work and, 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 and how, they, um, how they're really uh, how they really build and and neural networks like if you think of those uh of those constructs a little bit like of the brains uh, that are not made up from chemical components like ours are, but are really built from, from mathematical building blocks, um, then you really have to, in, in order to, to improve those, in order to make sure that those work even more efficiently and in our case produce better translations, you have to take a look at how are those are trained, how really the math works inside and how you make sure that those train even more efficiently efficiently or that they can kind of grasp the, 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 the problems or the intricacies of, of language uh, much better. And then this is combined also really with computer science because you're really trying to make AI work on a few years ago at least on GPUs that have been built for gaming and not for, uh, not for AI. So you're trying to put that computation over there, um, do that in parallel like with thousands of those GPUs. Uh, which fail like after a few hours of operations and uh, you gotta restart them and make it work so so there's a lot of really intricate engineering going around around the um, around the um, around the mathematical part got it so let's take some of that theory in into practice mm -hmm. um, and so personally I've been making investments on behalf of my firm in Europe for many years now and while I do speak a little Spanish, hablo un poco de español, I actually really appreciate that in Europe and the tech ecosystem, people are speaking English. It makes me very comfortable. And language, of course, is key to communication, personally, for business, etc. But if any of us have learned different languages in school, you know that what you learn in a textbook in a school setting doesn't always translate when you're sort of in the wild. And I guess I'll give you an example because the nuance and, and even small words can make a big difference. So, you know, part, pardon my language for a moment, but if I say to someone, hey, you're the shit, I'm actually giving them a big compliment, right? But if I say, hey, you're shit, that's a very different meaning. And that one word um, can lose a lot or, or convey a lot. And so, as you think about translating you know, those words and making sure, particularly in settings that are maybe sensitive, how do you continue to build a model that's accurate and as objectively better, particularly when we have some large competitors in the business, including one that's got a, you know, a big logo uh, right on the other side of this stage? Yeah, I think, that, I mean, there's, there's tons of factors that go into a great neural network uh, that, is, uh, that is built for translation. And that starts maybe even with the balance of how accurately do you want to translate versus how fluent you want to be in the target language. And there's, there's obvious trade-offs there. Like if you're, if you're translating a technical document, then uh, you are caring far more about the accuracy. It's, it's, it's got to really convey 100% the same meaning. On the other hand, if you're translating in market, getting text for a website, it just needs to be fluent in the other language. So kind of getting that trade-off right and getting the training data right uh, for those uh, different uh, cases is important. I think what is really important in general in neural networks and AI training um, is you um, usually when we are training those models, we are training them on, on tons of data and mostly it's internet crawled data because this is humanity's largest um, database. And uh, those those networks kind of consume everything that we've written, um, so they tend to kind of put out the average yeah. of that, and, and that's really not great. So after that, you have to really focus those uh, models on making sure that they are actually producing what they what they need. And we know reinforcement learning, we know a lot of other methods that are kind of showing those models. Hey, you've seen now all of that. You, you know how to do bad translation. You know how to go, do good translation. Yeah. You know how to do great translation. And now I'm asking you, please. Go, do great translation, don't do those bad ones. So um, there's, there's a lot of work in terms of how we are training, what we are training, but also really in the architectures of those models, how they're able to, to, to read the text and, and consume and, and put out something, something new. Got it. So let's translate that to the business for a second, and I'm going to eventually ask a provo provocative question here. But if you're a consumer, it's pretty easy to go to deepl.com or download the app, and you can translate what you might need in your daily life. 
and that's free. Uh, but there are also other free alternatives out there, um, like Google Translate and others. So why should someone pay for DeepL? And, 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 and along those lines, what has helped you build actually a very healthy and um, impressive enterprise business? Yeah, I think, I think we have tons of free users. I mean, let's first acknowledge that, and this is great. Um, for, for a company like ours, over the first years, um, we really didn't spend any money at marketing. Uh, we just had a great free service that was kind of, everybody was telling their friends that DeepL is around and uh, that, that just making their lives easier. Um, so uh, that, was, uh, that was a great opportunity for us to get market reach. Um, and we've used that and, and we're still using that. And, and, and we're kind of still joking that, that our free service, our biggest competitor, it's, it's not Google Translate, it's actually our free service. Uh, because there's probably quite a few people over here who are using the free translator and I don't know how many of you are paying for it. Uh, that's fine. That's good. Um, uh, but then, um, when we are when we are looking, uh, when we, when I'm looking back, um, we've been always pretty particular about making sure that um, we know that the products really works on a co on a commercial in, in a commercial setting that we can sell it. And uh, like kind of a few months after the first launch of the service itself, we've. Um, We've added the option to, to, to kind of go for, for DeepL Pro, and um, that has allowed people to consume more of a translation. Like if you're dealing with it each and every day, if, if DeepL is the first tab you're opening in the morning, um, then obviously you're going to benefit from higher quality translation, from things like uh, security, from, from the ability to customize your translations more. So th there, there's far more beyond the free service itself, but it is, it is a very tough question, I think, for every company that is doing a freemium model uh, to distinguish what is available in free and therefore what drives your, your viral growth versus how hard are you monetizing. Right, right. And, and this is obviously a big problem that people have had for you know, millennia, as long as people have been speaking, and therefore it attracts new customers. You know, a year ago, we weren't really talking about chat GPT, of course, the obvious obligatory chat GPT question. Um, <laughs> and now they've got translation built in as well. So the, the market's getting more competitive. How do you respond to that? Because I think originally when you know, we were talking about putting this chat together, it was about Goliath. But now there's more than one Goliath. Yeah, I think, I think I mean, it's not very very much of a different setup for us as a company. I mean, with one Goliath and two Goliaths, I mean, what's the difference, maybe? Um, it's... Uh, Need more slingshots. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, th I, think that, I, think that's, I think that's fine. I think, I think competition drives us forward also as a company, and it's really a good motivator um, from that perspective. But yes, the technology is going forward, and it's even not the competition itself as from a commercial perspective, but the technological competition, how this whole field of AI is advancing. That is putting our teams on the edge. That's, uh, that's definitely a hard one. And, and with kind of the advent of LLMs, we had to revamp a little bit of our, uh, of our research agenda and, and put our teams onto making sure that we can also master all of that and, and that we can put LLMs into, into operations in, in our translation. Um, fortunately, all of those technologies are really near to each other. So whether you're translating or whether you're building an LLM that is kind of like ChatGPT, that's pretty similar. So I think, I think, I think we're, we're kind of uh, in, a, in a very fortunate place either way. Got it. Now, also when you think about AI and, and large competitors, I think there's a, in the popular press, there's a debate, is AI a expansionary force or is it kind of a contractionary force? You know, are jobs being created, markets being expanded, or jobs being lost? Mm -hmm. Um, one of the favorite stories I have about one of the companies in our portfolio using DeepL is that they were you know, paying millions of dollars a year to translate their product and services into five languages. And now with DeepL, I think they're doing 20 more languages for a fraction of the cost. Do you think you know, DeepL is expanding the market, contracting the market? Is that generally true for AI? I, I think it, I think in general AI is expanding the market quite a lot, and and um, I, I think of us as really democratizing access to translation um, because think of a lot of our use cases. I mean, sometimes we just have a quick translation to do, and like I don't know, in the very early stages of DeepL, I had to translate our terms and conditions into English. Um, that's been crafted. yourself. Yeah, <laughs> it's been crafted by a German lawyer. I had to either to give it to that lawyer, and they're gonna take like lot of money for that or I'd have to give it to an agency and, and I'm not that great of a translator. I kind of speak 
fine English, but um, I'm not great at doing the job itself. And I just threw it in in DeepL, and it kind of worked. I yeah. mean, um, so so I had that instant access to that, and I didn't have to ask anybody for the translation. I didn't have to go anywhere. It took half an hour during a break at a McDonald's, actually. <laughs> uh, and uh, that, that makes our lives really easier if we get that access. On the other hand, all of the professionals, everybody who is working in the language industry is really utilizing AI for their own job. I mean, this has been our early adopters, users, um, everybody who was a translator. It just makes their lives also so much quicker. And through that combination, um, I think we can and on, only through that we can cope with this huge increasing demand for content in this world. Like companies are building more and more content, marketing is, is more and more important. You have to talk to customers, like the whole business is getting larger. And therefore, also through that, the localization industry can kind of cope with, this, with these increasing demands. Got it. OK. And I want to go back to something you said about the different foundational models, the proximity to them. You are building your own models. That is a core part of your IP. Should everyone be doing that? Who should be borrowing from the available public models? Who should be building their own? Well, we didn't have really any other, another opportunity, another chance. Like there was no models available True. on the market. Like 2017, when we've been coming out to the market, there, there was no transformer. Uh, there was no, uh, not a lot of uh, all of that has been built um, after that. So, so we had to start with that. And I think it's at the core of DeepL's DNA to, to kind of build our own stuff. Sometimes we're building a little bit too much. Um, but, but in general, if you want to really advance a certain area and, and, and be the best one, um, then probably you have to have control of that whole stack of technology. You have to own the models, you have to be able to understand them, and you have to be able to kind of build them in a way that, um, that they're going to be just better than your competition. If your product idea does not depend on you having the best technology, then obviously this does not make sense. This is a huge investment. You have to have we are running kind of an academic uh, research team within the company. Uh, so that doesn't make sense if your uh, strengths lie in product and go to market. But for us, this technology is kind of at the core of the company. And, and, and therefore, for us, that was never a question of whether we want to build it or not. Yeah, got it. Well, let's, and let's talk about that point. Because in order to build, and you have this research team, you, you have to recruit. And um, maybe another way to think about the sort of David versus Goliath theme, and we talked about this a little bit, is you know, the, the perception around where leadership in AI is coming from. Is it coming from San Francisco or the States? Uh, there are clearly some companies, DeepL amongst them in Europe, that are receiving a lot of funding and attention. What is your view on that sort of the, the geographic balance between the two? Well, I mean, we have to admit the fact that there's more technological companies and also more AI companies in the US. That's, that's just a statistic, I think. And, and uh, that does not mean that great companies cannot come off, out of Europe. And that does not mean that AI companies cannot challenge the big players like the Googles of this world. I mean, OpenAI has been a small company. I mean, it's in the US, yes, but it's, it's, it's been a small company. It's growing very quickly now. Um, but uh, they, they have taken up and challenged uh, a Goliath too, in, in, in a sense. Um, so, uh, so definitely there's ways of new companies coming up. And I think Europe has a chance doing that. I think in general, just due to the fact that we have a slightly smaller ecosystem over here, which is which is on a great trajectory, but it's still slightly smaller. We have to work a little bit harder uh, to accomplish what, what we need. We, we just don't have that much of experience in tech that has grown in Silicon Valley since like decades. Um, and we are a little bit more geographically distributed all over Europe, which does not help in kind of networking effects. Um, so uh, so to, to a large extent, we can, but we have to put some work into that. And we also have to stay patient. I mean, it, it's going to take a few years more until we there. Mm -hmm. And same vein, you know, recruit, this is, maybe this is a question that, can, that the other uh, founders and entrepreneurs in the room can take from, uh, take advice from in your answer. So you're recruiting, you know, the talented PhDs that are helping to build the model are in high demand at other companies too. What is it that you're looking for? What is it that resonates when you're trying to say, hey, instead of going to a Google, come join us at DeepL? 
what is it what is it that clicks what is it that they look for what is it that you look for I think I think we're building something that is just great in terms of the mission. Uh, I think connecting people and, and making them understand each other is is just a really nice purpose, honestly. And this is also why I'm uh, why I'm at, at DeepL and, and 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 why I want to uh, to be at at DeepL. And and this is important for a lot of researchers. And this is important for for a lot of the. In general, our employees, they, they want to make the, the world a, a little bit of a better place. We, we can't solve all of the problems, but at least we can, uh, we can get you a good coffee in <laughs> Finland. Um, so, uh, so, so, so I think that's, that's really helpful. And I think Europe has a lot of talent in, in terms of all that. I mean, I've been asked yesterday, why is there so many Polish names in AI nowadays? And, and apparently, yes, there is, there's, there's a lot I of Polish. I was Poles not aware of that. that. That's, that's, uh, I'll take a look. Th there is a lot of Poles there and, and also at OpenAI. And at Google, uh, honestly, and I think that boils down to this kind of theoretically founded uh, education uh, to a large extent. That was my answer to that question back then, um, and, I, and I think that also helps us in kind of the recruiting. Like we, we have, uh, we have a lot of countries that are really uh, setting focus on that in Europe, and this 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 builds like kind of the talent that we really need. Yeah, and I would I would have to admit if I can poke fun at my own country, the fact that. Um, your business is about translation is probably better suited to be built in Europe because, as we all know, the vast majority of Americans don't know that there's any other language out there except for English. I didn't want to say that. So. <laughs> well, I I'm, can say I'm it. leaving this up to you, Mr. American. Yeah. Um, maybe to wrap up, because I think also a lot of pe times people like to think about AI, what's going to happen in the future. Uh, maybe a little bit of that disruptive question. If you think about entertainment and translation, you know, right now Disney Plus is in a lot of languages. They hire uh, staff. You can see it in the credits at the end of every episode of all the different voice uh, actors and actresses. And then you have some multilingual actors. You know, a couple of Germans come to mind: Diane Kruger, Michael Fassbender. Excellent actors can do uh, work across geographies. Are we getting to a world where, and now that the, the, the writer's strike is over in the, in the States, are we getting to a world where maybe the writers can put the script out, DeepL translates it across languages so you don't need an agency anymore, and then, you know, an Eleven Labs takes the text and makes it voice, and that becomes the soundtrack on some Dolly or Synthesia video, and, and that's just what we're going to consume as, as media content? I think the world is probably moving quite strongly into that direction. I don't want to say that this is going to be there in the next year. Um, I think there's parts of translation that are easier and there's parts of translations that are harder. And actually, movies are really hard um, because like, if, you're, if you're looking at a, at a journal in the New York Times, I mean, it's, it's really nicely written, it's complete, it, it contains all of the context. So if you're translating that, like DeepL is going to be practically flawless like it's it's going to be a perfect translation of that if you look at a at a movie like the 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 text and the subtitles they're just so usually very 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 small without context like you have to watch the video itself to understand what's happening um, with the text so it, this is a really hard translation um, but yes I think like looking at the trajectory and how things have been developing and how translation quality has been rising over over the last years I do feel strongly that uh, that we're gonna be able to to, to really uh, have a lot of the translation being done by computers and by AI so maybe we'll actually have more content to watch because it'll cost less to create. Uh, I mean, yeah, and kind of, you're not going to be watching movies in English with subtitles anymore, that's but true. maybe you're going to have them dubbed as, in, as they're doing in Germany, for that's example. Tr that's true, that's true. Um, well, I think that takes us about up to our time. So um, I just want to say thank you, gracias, merci, danke Shane, kitos, and thank you in any other ways, but really appreciate the time, Yarek, and uh, congrats on the success so far and more to come. Thank you very much, Dinkoya, and it's been a great pleasure being here at Slush with you guys.